Go ahead, President Sandoval. All right, perfect, thank you. All right, well, let's call this meeting to order at 6.03 p.m. Ms. Contra, would you mind uh, walking us through a roll call? I would be happy to, sir. Mrs. Pingarelli? Here. Mr. Sandoval? Here. Mrs. Seha Martinez? Here. Mrs. Underhill? Here. Mrs. Stone? Here. Thank you. All right, very good. Well, again, welcome everybody this evening. Uh, it's great to hear everybody's voices. Um, we have a, a few items to get through here this evening that are, you know, certainly critical to the district as always. But uh, so let's uh, let's move on uh, to our opening exercises. Uh, uh, Two point one moment of silence and pledge of allegiance. Uh, Miss Ari, any anyone on your end that um, uh, will be uh, uh, would like to run us through the pledge. President Sandoval, uh, we'll divert to you, whomever you'd like to have lead us. <laughs> okay, perfect. Well, I, looking at all these great pictures on the screen, I'm just gonna close my eyes and, and uh, randomly select somebody. I know it's, uh, that said, um, I mean, Ms. Palace Thompson, would you mind uh, leading us in the pledge? Um, and, uh, and as prior to doing so, we will uh, recognize a moment of silence as well. So let's uh, go ahead and um, go through our moment of silence. And uh, then Ms. Dallas Thompson, if you can just uh, begin the pledge at um, your uh, comfort level. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag. of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Charles Thompson. Thank you. All right, moving on to section three, address agenda. Address the agenda, consider adoption, or recommended or, or recommend changes. Uh, board members, Ms. Stone? I don't have anything, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, uh, Ms. Underhill. I don't have any changes. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Pigarelli. I'm good. All right. Ms. Seha Martinez. I'm good as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And I'm good also. All right. Very good. Thank you. Uh, moving on to section four, uh, board, uh, uh, or recognition. Ms. Ari, I apologize. Well, good evening again, President Sandoval, members of the board, Mrs. Palace Thompson. Tonight, we have the pleasure of celebrating our dedicated employees who have served the Peoria Unified School District and are entering uh, that welcome stage of retirement at the end of this school year. And so uh, typically when we are gathered together and in our governing board room, we have an opportunity to see many of their faces and to kind of uh, send them off into this next chapter. Uh, of course, given uh, the pandemic that we find ourselves in the midst of, we didn't, we still didn't want to miss the opportunity just to thank them for all that they have done for their years of service. Uh, I will ask Mr. Dennis if he can scroll through those so that you can see them. And uh, we'll share just a few little tidbits with you about uh, their years of service. And you can see the names of some of these really dedicated employees uh, who have, of course, served us, uh, our community and our schools. Uh, so I know this isn't quite the farewell they likely would have expected or maybe the end to their career, uh, but we have about 88 individuals who are retiring. Uh, their average time served in our district is 28 years, if you can believe that. Even uh, more amazing, I believe, is that collectively this group of retirees has more than 1,900 years of service, if you were to add all of that uh, together. So um, certainly uh, they will be missed. Uh, we're hopeful that they were able to have some virtual send-offs from their uh, respective sites. I know we saw uh, many photos circulating through our social media channels, just recognizing and celebrating uh, which
We, we just didn't want to miss the opportunity to say thank you, to make sure that they understand that um, their wisdom and insight is certainly ir uh, irreplaceable, but that we have always saved a special part uh, here in our Peoria Unified uh, School District for them uh, to remain a part of our family. We hope they'll come back and volunteer with us uh, and, and serve in our community so that we can still see them and um, make sure that uh, they are wished well as they enter this next phase. No. Thank you for that, Ms. Ari. Um, board members, any uh, comments? Congratulations. I'll, I'll start with Ms. Stone. To make sure my mic's off, <laughs> off mute. Um, I, was, I just wanted to say, wow, that's a lot of years. That's a lot of uh, hard work. And I am grateful to, you know, our teachers for the work they put in. And um, there are some known names on there that uh, will be missed. So I, I wish everyone well and and happiness and peace in in their upcoming um, adventure. Yes, indeed. Thank you for that, Miss Stone. Uh, Miss Underhill. I would agree. I mean, what an amazing amount of dedication with the average, of, you know, length of service of 28 years. It's just, it's really awesome that these folks have dedicated their lives to really shaping our kids and you really have. So I hope that you can, you know, retire and move on to your next adventure, as Ms. Stone said, um, with a real feeling of satisfaction that you truly, truly did make an impact on so many lives and that is impacting our community and our future. So thank you and stay well and enjoy um, your next chapter. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, uh, Ms. Pingarelli. Well, I also wanted to say thank you to everybody. Um, I, I think that uh, in this day and age, uh, it seems like most people don't stay with um, one place that long. So that they've stayed with PUSD um, uh, as long as they have is uh, says uh, a lot about our district. So I just want to wish everybody well. Um, and I wish I were with you guys. So thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you for that, uh, Ms. Sam Martinez. Thank you, President Sandoval. I, I appreciate the administration bringing this to our attention because I saw many platforms on social media highlighting, and I cannot imagine spending 28 years and having a send off where you cannot. Uh, find closure, but please to all the retirees on the list. Um, some of them who coached, who were my teachers, uh, who've mentored, know that your legacy lives on as we move forward in our district. The average retirement age, uh, time span is about 25 years, 9,125 days to be uh, exact with the 25 years. And I hope that you continue to provide insight uh, to the governing board as you sit from afar with different perspectives and let us know how we can continue to leverage your experiences. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for that, Ms. Sam Martinez. And yeah, uh, absolutely agreed with everything that's already been said. Thank you. Um, there's no doubt, uh, you know, those who uh, get into education, you know, our teachers, staff, admin, all um, special individuals and unique uh, and, uh, you know, truly uh, lead by example um, with regard to why we are here on this earth. And that is to enrich the lives of others. Um, every day and uh, actually you have done that to, to many i mean 28 years and uh, on average and then 1900 years of service combined and um, that's amazing and, uh, and so with that said i definitely want to thank you know uh leadership in the district throughout those years um you know i think uh, also individuals who stay in professions or with an organization for that many years um is also a testament to um you know leadership and, and and leading with others in mind. So, so thank you for that. That said, uh, Ms. Ari, thank you very much uh, for uh, for this uh, this recognition. That said, moving right along to four point two board comments, uh, Ms. Stone. Board comments on what? Uh, just uh, any anything oh, that you would like okay, to. Okay. Yeah. Um, no. Um, I just want to say that. It seems like our uh, our district has pulled things together really well during this uh, 
pandemic and that um, I hope that I, I see there's probably some change coming in the way things are done. And I, I hope that our, our district can continue and um, do excellent work in the future like like they are have been doing, you know, as far as getting everything together so fast and pulling together and getting the kids um, some education at home or whatever they need. And also, you know, planning for the future with the graduations. Um, it's been really, really good. And, and so I, I like to see in the future that it looks, it looks like the district will be able to cope. Right. So that makes me happy. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for that, Ms. Stone. Uh, Ms. Stone Real? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that I'm just, I'm just awestruck really by the work that all of the schools, both elementary and high schools did to make sure that our eighth graders and our class of 2020 seniors um, got the recognition and the, you know, the kind of the send off and the celebration that they really deserved. Um, I was able to attend several of the promotions and um, a few of the high school drive through graduations, including um, my sons at Sunrise Mountain High School. And it was just above and beyond. Like, I don't even know what to say, except that <laughs> as a senior parent, I was concerned, you know, that's a ginormous milestone. And it just really made my heart happy. And so many people, so many parents' hearts just full, I think, to see the extent that our schools and our staff and our principals and our leadership and our community, including, you know, the city of Peoria and the police, et cetera, went to to make sure that those kids felt special. And honestly, I think that like many people have said, it's going to be one of the most memorable, you know, um, class graduations in a long time. But just hats off. You guys did a phenomenal job of recognizing our outstanding student body and our um, eighth graders and our graduating seniors. And I just couldn't be more grateful. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for that, Ms. Underhill. Uh, Ms. Pingarelli? I'm good. Okay. Uh, Ms. Sam Martinez? I'll just highlight uh, the promotions as well. As a governing board member, we are the fourth largest district in the state of Arizona, and it is so difficult to get to all these graduation ceremonies and eighth grade promotions and even kindergarten. And the fact that our staff behind the scenes were cognizant of trying to capture those moments, even for family members that were outside the state, um, it was really, for selfish reasons, beneficial for the for a board member such as myself to see all those moments across the state because normally there's no way we can be at all those places at one time. And so I wanna thank the behind the scenes staff that were able to capture those moments for us so that we can all enjoy. So thank you. Yes, thank you for that. And and yeah, it's I, I agree. The uh, how the district as a whole has adapted um, to this pandemic and what we're going through and our, our ability to, you know, adapt to change uh, and never waver, waver from, you know, our just cause, which again is, you know, to ensure the success and wellness, you know, of our students, uh, teacher staff and, and their families, but uh, just great job across the board. But uh, I agree uh, with some of the same that Ms. Underhill made and, and, uh, um, and, and Ms. Uh, Sarah Martinez in and around these uh, these promotions and graduations. I mean, just to see the intentionality and, and the thoughtfulness that went into planning um, these um, these ceremonies uh, was just a uh, it was just inspiring. Um, you know, and to watch families come through um, with the entire family. There's some of them had truckloads of. Uh, of uh, you know siblings and um, and relatives, and, along with pets, <laughs> they invited the pets along, which which was great. So, um, and, and to even watch the, uh, the the teachers as the students approached and uh, uh, to have a conversation with them, you can really tell um, one that the conversation was um, one that was of um, I guess motivation and inspiration, and the student really grabbed onto a lot of the words. It seemed like uh, from a distance that uh, they're grabbing a lot of the words that were being said by uh, the teachers and staff. So, again, great job um, across the board of uh, just really, you know, adapting to what we're going through and, and uh, you know, continuing these celebrations. So, thank you for that. That said, um, thank you, everybody. Uh, moving on to four.
point three. Uh, uh, Ms. Palace Thompson. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Sandoval. Um, I'd like to share um, some honors that our teachers and some of our students have received. First of all, the, the Association for Career and Technical Education recently announced that Christina Quant, Chris Quant, Zudi Hill's um, teacher, was selected as CTE Junior High Outstanding Teacher of the Year, and that was a pretty amazing honor for somebody to receive. Um, also, Melissa Grimshide, CTE, no, Centennial Science Teacher, got the Air Force Association uh, Teacher of the Year Award. And that also very impressive, very highly sought after award. Megan Maxwell, sixth grade teacher at Cheyenne, was appointed to Maricopa County Superintendent Steve Watson's Teacher Advisory. And that's also a very big honor. I wanna, again, congratulate Megan and Melissa and Chris for their hard work and for all the things that they do to show how outstanding they and we are for, for working with them. Also, the um, National Football Foundation named Connor Quartz from Cactus High School and Ryan Rafiti from Peoria High School is two of the Class of 2020 Scholar Athletes. Amazing award, amazing award, very exciting for them. And finally, Sunrise Mountain Senior Cameron Deal was named a National Merit Scholar. Less than 1% uh, of our high school's graduates qualify for this amazing award. And so it's, it's really an incredible accomplishment. And I, I could point out also that Cameron is one of the highest scholarship earners from our district and has collectively earned more than 900,000 for post-secondary instruction from those institutions. I also just, just want to say that all of the administrators, and you've pointed that out, and their teams just truly went above and beyond what, what they should have and what they could have to celebrate some of our students, all of our students, um, at the end of the year. Uh, I appreciate their hard work. It's unique times, and they did it in a unique way. So thank you very much for letting me share those, those recognitions. Now, th thank you, Ms. Palace Thompson. Those are uh, amazing achievements uh, and certainly uh, pride to Peoria moments uh, without question. So thank right. you for that. Right. Yeah. So thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Moving right along. Uh, public comments. Uh, Ms. Contra, do we have any public comment that uh, uh, on matters uh, regarding matters not included on the agenda? I don't believe we do. Mr. Sandoval, no, we do not have any public comment that is not tied to an agenda item. Okay, so we'll re I'll re read the others as we get to to those line items later on in the uh, in the meeting. Thank you for that. Uh, moving along to the consent agenda, do uh, I have any board members that would wish to pull uh, any line items from the consent agenda? President Sandoval? Yes, ma'am. This is Ms. Seha Martinez. May I request a pool 6.3, the Human Resources Report? Of course. Ms. Stone, do you have any items that uh, you would like to pull from consent? I think you may be on mute. <laughs> Um, no, um, I, I don't have anything. I just, um, I'm going to be away from the mic for a couple minutes. Amy is having an issue, so I'm, I'm able to hear, but I don't need to make any comments at this time. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Underhill, any items that you wish to pull from the consent agenda? No, I'm good. Thank you. All right. Ms. Pingarelli? No, I'm good also. Okay. Me as well. Okay. Very good. So I do need a motion to approve the consent agenda minus, uh, sorry, 6.3 human resources report. I move to approve the consent agenda minus 6.3 human resources report. I'll second. Second. Okay. So we have a motion by Ms. Underhill and a second by, I believe that was Ms. Pingarelli. That is correct. 
All right, perfect. So Ms. Contra, if you can uh, run us through a roll call vote here, that would be great. Yes, sir. Mrs. Pingarelli? Aye. Mr. Sandoval? Aye. Mrs. Joan? Aye. Mrs. Seha Martinez? Aye. Mrs. Underhill? Aye. All right, so moved. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sam Martinez, uh, Human Resource Report. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to discuss the Human Resources Report. Uh, I've, we've collectively uh, mentioned that we take the opportunity to review um, these re reports that are presented to the board. And in this particular situation, it's related to liquidated damages and currently the policy that addresses anybody who breaks a, a contract is assessed uh, a dollar amount. In lieu of our current situation, COVID-19, uh, I would like to ask the board consider, te consider temporary waiving liquidated damages uh, to show our empathy and understanding that everybody has been impacted um, and for these five that are presented to us tonight, uh, that we waive all liquidated damages. Gotcha. Um, Ms. Contra, um, just a matter of order. I mean, are we able to waive damages? I mean, are we able to, to adapt the uh, GCQC uh although it's not uh, line item in today's agenda. Mm, President Sandoval, that is a very good question. This is attached to an entire human resources report, which includes all of the items um, attached. So the motion would read to ratify as presented in its entirety. Um, I could change the motion, I believe, to read to approve the human resources report with the exception of liquidated damages. And okay, please, okay. any staff member that uh, is better versed in that can correct me if I am in error with that. Ms. Contra, this is uh, Jason Reynolds, President Sandoval, Governing Board. I, I do believe that, that's a, that that is accurate. You are able to change the motion and address the, uh, the individuals that are on the, the resignation report, uh, but, but not to make any changes to actual policy. Gotcha. So, uh, Miss Miss Anne Martinez, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. Um, I'm wondering because I, I definitely want to follow protocol here. Uh, so, if we went through approved the human resources report minus the uh, resignation liquidated damages recommended, um, and 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 have in a subsequent board meeting the liquidated damages and a team, I'm speaking out loud. So have liquidated damages as a line item on a future board meeting to discuss uh, this, you know, the suspension, if you will, um, uh, of this or the waiving of uh, the damages during the, uh, the COVID-19 or the time that, you know, there is school closure. Is, does that, does that make sense? Yes, it does. I appreciate the conversation. Um, and to your point, I am not requesting to change the policy only to look uh, at the current situation as you described for those impacted. Um, and yes, so to answer your question, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd be open to, to certainly having that discussion. So. Um, I agree. Sorry, it's Corey. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, Ms. Contra, can, um, if there's no um, other comments, um, around how we're going to kind of shift the motion. Um, can you read that for me one more time and then I'll, uh, we'll get a, a motion going. 
Absolutely, President Sandoval. I am currently adjusting the motion to read motion to ratify the Human Resources Board report as presented with the exception of liquidated damages. Okay, so I will need, I'll need a motion to ratify the Human Resources report as presented minus the um, the recommended liquidated damages. President Sandoval. I move to motion what you just stated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I'll, I'll second that. So Ms. Contra, we have a, a motion uh, by uh, Ms. Uh, Sayah Martinez uh, and a second uh, by myself. Uh, yes, sir, thank you. When I call your name, please cast your vote. Mrs. Pingarelli. No. Mr. Sandoval? Yay. Mrs. Dome? Yay. Mrs. Seha Martinez? Yay. Mrs. Underhill? Yay. Thank you very much. That passes for one. All right, very good. Thank you for that. Um, uh, we are moving along, right? We, we're good with the consent agenda now, Ms. Contra. Yes, sir, we are good with the consent agenda. That was approved. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, board members. Uh, moving on to uh, section eight agenda items, uh, 8.1 consideration and possible adoption of a resolution ordering all matters necessary for a 13% maintenance and operation budget override continuation election to be held on November 3rd, 2020. And this is being um, discussed and presented by uh, Ms. Linda Pallas Thompson, Dr. Reynolds, Ms. Michelle Myers, and Mr. Sean Duguid. We are all ears. President Sandoval, I, I beg your pardon. Um, we do have public comment attached to 8.1. Would you like those read before or after the presentation? Thank you for keeping me in line there. Yes, please. Uh, let's proceed with public comment and then we'll get into discussion. Thank you very much. The first public comment comes tonight from Mr. Armando Mas Macias. Passage of both bond and override are a must in order for our district to continue to make progress. The recommendation the committee made to the board was motivated by two things, doing what is right for the children and doing what is right for residents. Time and discussion focused on making recommendations that were reasonable and prudent. It became very apparent that comments made by one of our board members made a very strong political statement. It's short-sighted to suggest a decrease in funding at this time. Every member should be focused on the future for our schools, not what is going to get votes in November's election. I have one request for all board members. If you truly, if you're truly for our children, then vote yes for both items. The next comment comes from Ms. Jill Melarani. Good evening, President Sandoval, members of the governing board and Mrs. Pallas Thompson. My name is Jill Melarani and I'm a friend to Frontier Elementary parent. I would like to ask that you only go out for an override this election cycle. Past polling results show that voters will approve a bond over an override, and we cannot allow this override to fail. Additionally, I am happy to see that you have a facility utilization committee on the agenda tonight. The group of community members can put together a bond that will serve the entire district for years to come, rather than limiting our ask with this mandate bond when they put their recommendation together. Thank you all for your service to our district. Next comment is from Dr. Patty Beltram. Thank you board members for allowing me to serve on the Citizens Advisory Committee as a parent of a PUSD student. I speak in favor of the 13% budget override. Our current, but our current override is for 13% and the passing of this override will maintain current funding to people and programs. Specifically, the override supports salaries for all teachers and programs like all-day kindergarten, arts, athletics, and gifted. 
If this override would fail, there would be cuts in staff and administration may have to eliminate high school block scheduling, among other considerations. The elimination of block scheduling would cut opportunities for students to take electives like arts and CTE. I believe that block scheduling supports student success, allowing for more opportunities for student choice, remediation and advancement, and is one of the factors that Peoria Unified School District realizes a high a high graduation graduation rate. Please support the 13% budget override. The last uh, comment tied to this agenda item is from Ms. Casey Franklin. Good evening, President Sandoval, members of the Governing Board and Superintendent Palace Thompson. I'm writing to you today regarding the proposed bond and override you are discussing tonight. I strongly encourage each of you to support these measures. Our district has been facing ever increasing needs across all areas of the district. These needs have been compounding over the years since we have had the support of the community for a new bond. We have, we have increasing numbers of campuses that need renovations for sanitation and safety and others that need measures to ensure a safe closed campus for all students. Our technology has also fallen behind and has prevented us from keeping pace with technology changes that would be beneficial to student success in this modern world. We also face an aging bus fleet in need of maintenance and upgrades to keep our students safe during transportation. Without our override programs like All Day Kindergarten to help our earliest learners, assistant principals to help lead our schools, nurses to keep our students health, and PE, athletics, and arts programs to keep our students engaged and active would cease to exist. In a time when our community is facing economic challenges, the minimal tax savings of a 12% versus 13% will put undue burden on our families. The difference in a 12% versus 13% override is approximately $10 a year for the average home in Peoria. The cost for a family to individually seek out the programs that would be cut by this choice could cost a typical family thousands of dollars per year while only saving approximately $10 per year in property tax costs. The tax savings of reducing the override amount pales in comparison to the cost our families will now be burdened with should we lose this funding. These measures are both fiscally responsible and provide specific plans for funding use. The bond and override committees took very seriously the opinions of those who previously opposed prior bonds and overrides. The proposed measures are already a compromise between the needs of our students to excel and the desire of the community to avoid tax increase. Approval for, bo for both of these items also provides our community a de decreasing tax rate while providing for the critical needs of the district. For all of these reasons and many more, I strongly encourage the board to approve ballot measures for both of these items. It's the right thing to do for our students, our teachers, principals, and staff, for our community, and to keep Peoria the exceptional learning community that it has always been. Thank you for your time and consideration. Those are all the public comments tied to agenda item 8.1. Perfect, thank you for that, Ms. Contra. Ms. Palace Thompson, um, if uh, we can make sure that we thank all these individuals for their, their comments, uh, in addition to keeping them abreast of any updates as it relates to uh, this particular line item. I certainly will, Mr. Sandoval. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Good evening, Sandoval, uh, members of the governing board, uh, and Mrs. Palace Thompson, the purpose of tonight's governing board agenda item is for administration to bring forward the resolutions required to officially call for a bond and or MNO override election on November 3rd, 2020. On May 21st, 2020, administration was directed to prepare resolutions related to the Citizens Advisory Committee recommendations for the November 3rd, 2020 election that include the continuation of the district's current 13% MNO override with current position and program categories and critical needs bond authorization, including land for a new high school. Joining the governing board meeting virtually this evening is the district's bond counsel, Mr. Paul Gales, with the law firm Greenberg Trowerk, as well as Mr. Brian Lundberg and Ms. Randy Stein from Stiefel Nicholas and Company, the district's bond underwriting firm. The members of the professional team and administration can answer your questions at the end of the presentation. The Citizens Advisory Committee recommendations, which are on the next slide, Thank you. The Citizens Advisory Committee's recommendation for a critical needs bond has been rounded to 
$1,255,000 total authorization amount. District administration has worked with the district's bond council and underwriting firm to incorporate the committee's recommendations into the required resolution format for governing board approval. Included in tonight's agenda is the complete bond authorization resolution document that includes the proposed capital improvements based on the Citizens Advisory Committee's recommendations and the associated estimated tax rates for the capital improvements that would be part of the new bond program. Projected bond tax rates for existing and new bonds associated with the November 2020 election are included in this bar graph with existing bond sales denoted in dark blue and a potential new $125 million bond authorization with the first associated bond payments beginning in fiscal year 22, 2022 rather, are denoted in gray. The combined existing and new bond property tax rates are projected to decrease over time as the district continues to pay off existing bond sales and manages the size and amortization of future bond sales, assuming assessed property valuation levels in the district remain at least at fiscal year 2021 levels in the future. Next slide, please. At the May 21st, 2020 Governing Board meeting, it was shared that the Citizens Advisory Committee recommended the continuation of the district's current 13% M&O override with a continuation of the current funding categories. The associated resolution is part of tonight's agenda for consideration and approval. And if we stay on this slide, please, the recommended 13% M&O override is defined as an M&O override continuation in the associated resolution document because the override percentage would remain 13% and the current budget override that is in place would continue. During the Citizens Advisory Committee meetings and at the May 21st Governing Board meeting, there was discussion related to the 13% M&O override tax rate. It has been previously communicated that the tax rate for the district's current 13% M&O override has decreased from fiscal year 2017 to fiscal year 2021 in part due to an increase in the district's assessed valuation, a flat or decreasing tax rate for the continuation of the 13% M&O override is dependent on external factors, including the assessed value of property in the district, annual student enrollment, annual funding, and other factors that can increase the revenue control limit and associated property taxes. Due to these external factors, future year tax rates cannot be guaranteed not to change. Next slide, please. This data table and graph detail the property tax rates associated with the current 13% M&O override in conjunction with existing bond property tax rates. The combined tax rate decrease each year is depicted in the bar graph with the M&O override denoted in green and the existing bonds denoted in blue. The combined secondary tax rate has decreased from $3.26 per $100 of limited assessed value in fiscal year 2017 to $2.92 in fiscal year 2021. And if we go to the next slide, as it has been previously communicated, the reduction in the bond and M&O override tax rates has in part been a result of the increased assessed valuation within the district's property tax base in recent years. Next slide, please. And on the final slide, we incorporate the projected tax rates that are included in the attached resolutions in comparison with the current tax rate in fiscal year 2020 and the projected tax rate for fiscal year 2021. The M&O override tax rate calculation is a very conservative estimate due to the requirement to project the fiscal year 2022 revenue control limit with the prior year's assessed valuation. The table also includes the projection for the combined bond tax rate that was depicted in the bar graph earlier in the presentation and demonstrates that assuming a constant assessed valuation compared to fiscal year 2021, the bond tax rate of existing bond sales and new bond sales continues to decline as outstanding bonds are paid off in comparison to the size and amortization timeline associated with new bond sales. And if we move to the next slide, thank you. This concludes the presentation associated with the bond and override resolutions and both agenda items. At this time, administration and our professional advisors and bond council are available to answer your questions. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Myers, for the, uh, the information. Um, Ms. Stone, any questions, comments? I, uh, I really believe this is a very unfortunate time to do this. And I'm really, I'm really not going to argue the whole point, but, uh, this is a time of great economic uncertainty in our community and, um, literally nobody that I have spoken to outside of the education realm has agreed that they would vote for this. Nobody. Um, I was hoping we could put this off until next year and, 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 and go out then, or I was willing to support a lesser um, override than this, but I, I, just have to say, I'm, I'm really not ready to support a 13%. So that's about all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Stone, for, for your comments. Um, Ms. Underhill? Um, I guess I would just say that I, you know, I understand what Ms. Stone is saying about this being a time of economic uncertainty, which is why we absolutely need a continuation of our 13% override. Um, with the pandemic and the recovery period coming up, we know there's going to be additional costs associated with our new normal way of doing education. And we know we have existing things and programs and um, innovations that we had already planned to um, integrate within our community. And number one, we need to take care of our people, um, our people and our programs and our children. So I'm fully still supportive of the 13% override. I think it's the right thing to do. I believe our committee did their due diligence. I believe we are still projecting a net tax decrease when we look at that combined, combined secondary rate. So my um, stance on this has not changed at all. I am for both the 13% override and the critical needs bond. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Underhill. Uh, Ms. Pingarelli? No, oh, thank you, President Sandoval. Um, I would like to make a formal statement on this agenda item. The economic shutdown due to COVID-19 has had a painful impact on our local businesses and families. And these are the constituents we, as a governing board, represent. As I mentioned last week during our special board meeting, I believe a continuation of the 13% override at this time, especially if there's a potential tax increase on our community, is unwise. I was hopeful that we could have proposed a reduction in the override amount to slightly lower than 13%. Expressing to our community, we understand their situation and that we're trying to do what we can to provide the additional services we believe are important to district families and students that the override funds would accomplish. I wish to commend our superintendent and chief financial officer for their efforts to find these savings while minimizing the impact on our students, teachers, and staff. Based on the comments from fellow board members, I believe the majority of our board will approve a 13% override ballot initiative. But right now, I cannot support a potential tax increase on our constituents. I will always be respectful to the majority decision by the board. Therefore, I'm willing to let PUSD voters tell us what they think. And so I'm abstaining on this agenda item. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Springer-Rally, uh, for your comments. Uh, it's uh, Ms. Sayer Martinez. Thank you, President Sandoval and fellow governing board members. Uh, there's no way to sugarcoat the uncertainty that we are all facing. Um, I was asked uh, to serve on a governing board to serve our children, and those are the 37,000 students that majority of them cannot vote. Uh, and to, as I serve them as well, my priority has always been and will be safety first. And I look at what the committee 
has looked through um, in meeting those safety needs first, which includes nurses. They are going to be crucial moving forward as the governor has announced that we will be going back to school. We don't know what that looks like, but I guarantee that our school nurses that are included in this override are going to be instrumental in keeping our children safe. In addition to our assistant principals, as we help our staff and community members recognize the importance of safety through these challenge challenges. Um, I stand with my fellow governing board members and making the best decisions for our students. And I believe in the mission that the Peoria Unified School District stands for, as I am a proud alumni K-12, and I trust my children in this school district as well. So I will stand for the 13%. Thank you, Ms. Sarah Martinez. Uh, and, and thank you, fellow board members, for all of your comments and, and candor. Um, I, I'd like to say this. Um, you know, I, I believe that each one of us wants the override to, to be successful and wants the district to be successful, or we just come at it from from different purviews uh, and, and lenses. Um, you know, I, I, one of the comments that uh, you know, Ms. Senator made, you know, in around the 13% and it, uh, you know, really kind of allowed us to maintain, right, you know, our, our current level of instruction and support, you know, for our students, teachers, staff, and the community for that matter. Because, you know, I've said it before, you know, a thriving school district equates to a thriving community. Um, and uh, Ms. Stone, you made a comment that I agree with 100% uh, at the beginning and when you were talking about just, you know, how proud you are of the district and uh, its ability to continue to service, you know, our, our, you know, our most valuable assets, our youth at a very high level. Um, and uh, I, I, I agree. I, I think, you know, by ensuring that, you know, we continue to um, provide PUSD with the resources that it needs to continue, you know, again, the, the high caliber teachers and regulars curriculum and uh, all the support services that we have. And Ms. Sayo Martinez mentioned the nurses and the assistant principals. All of those factors are a part of our village. And, um, you know, to, to continue to do right on behalf of our our students, teacher, staff, and admin um, will result in us doing right on behalf of all of our stakeholders, which includes our surrounding communities. That said, um, you know, I know we uh, we went out for you know 15% last year, which was needed to to include some light items. So, you know, we are making a concession, uh, like I said, to stay you know at least level you know with our current funding uh, levels. Um, and uh, and putting us and really the community in the best position, you know, to um, you know realize um, a more efficient uh, 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 tax levels, if you will. So that said, uh, I you know I my um, certainly uh, support uh, and, and vote to move forward with a thirteen percent override uh, in November has has not changed. So thank you again, uh, board members, for, for all your comments and candor. So with that said, I do need a motion. Uh, Ms. Myers, I, I'm going to assume that your um, presentation is complete. President Sand, of all members of the board, yes, it is complete. Thank you. Okay. So um, I need a motion to approve 8.1, which is the consideration of possible adoption of a resolution ordering all matters necessary for a 13% maintenance and operation budget override continuation election to be held on November 3rd, 2020. President Sandoval, this is Ms. Seho Martinez. I move as you stated. Thank you. In regards to, in regards to to consideration of the 13% maintenance and operation. Okay. And I'll second. All right. So, Ms. Contra, we have a motion by Ms. Sam Martinez and a second by Ms. Underhill. So, if you want to run us through a roll call vote, that would be great. Yes, sir. Thank you, President Sandoval. Mrs. Pingarelli? Abstain. 
Mr. Sandoval? Yes. Mrs. Doan? No. Mrs. Seha Martinez? Yes. Mrs. Underhill? Yes. That motion carries three yay, one nay, and one abstain. All right, again, thank you, fellow board members and Ms. Contra. Thank you for uh, um, running us through that roll call vote. Okay, moving right along to 8.2, uh, consideration and possible adoption of a resolution ordering and authorizing all matters necessary for a bond election to be held on November 3rd, 2020. Uh, if this resolution is so adopted, the deadline for submitting arguments with respect to its respect to it is August 7th, 2020 at 5 p.m. Um, so uh, Ms. Ms. Linda, Linda Palace Thompson, Dr. Reynolds, uh, Ms. Myers, Mr. Duguid, um, we are uh, at your service all years. Thank you. Good evening, President, Se uh, President Sandoval, members of the governing board, uh, Mrs. Palace Thompson. <sighs> The presentation with agenda item 8.2 is the same presentation that we just uh, went through. I'm happy to uh, answer questions or, or to cover any of the points again, but I do not have additional information to add to the presentation at this time. Okay, thank you for that. President um, Sandoval? Yes, ma'am. I beg your pardon. I do have two comments, public comments tied to this agenda item. <laughs> Ms. Contra, yes, you do, and I apologize. Yes, let's please um, listen to those public comments before we get into discussion by the board members. Thank you. The first public comment is from Dr. Patty Beltram. Thank you, Governing Board, for allowing me to serve on the Citizens Advisory Committee as a PUSD parent. Thank you to Sean Duguid and his team for providing a wealth of information on the status of each of the 40 plus buildings in our district. I speak in favor of this bond for it addresses the critical needs of all school buildings in the district, critically needed technology, repairs and replacement of transportation, and purchases of land for a much needed high school for the northern part of the Peoria Unified School District. I appreciate the data presented that shows the new home starts in North Peoria that really emphasize how overcrowded Liberty High School is currently and how there is no end in sight for that growth. The bond request is almost half of the current bond and would, in essence, lower the tax rate as requested by key stakeholders in our district's voting population. Personally, I would have loved to have added the building on the, of the new high school. However, being fiscally conscious, that amount would take us too high. I support the, the bond as presented. I also realize that not having the building of the new high school on this bond, Liberty High School will not see relief. Personally, as a parent of a Liberty High School student, this is already a critical need. Plus, creating social distancing in an overpopulated school is going to be a challenge. Please support the bond as presented for the November election. Thank you. Next comment is from Mrs. Eva Osuna. I am in support of the recommendations the Citizens Advisory Committee submitted and which subsequently were approved by the school board at the last board meeting. I concur with the recommendation of putting both a bond and an override on the November ballot. It is important to consider that there have been two attempts to get bonds and overrides approved by the public to no avail. I agree with having a similar or a smaller bond amount that is recommended because if we do not approve funding this year, our school district will experience a devastating blow. Purchasing land now with the intent to build a much needed high school in the north is not the ideal plan, but we have to secure a high school for the northern student students and it is a plan that we can move forward with. The override is needed now more than ever. People and programs are the heart of the Peoria Unified School District and is now a priority. Considering the incident at Westgate last week, I feel we must get the funding needed for the safety element. The young man that was the shooter stated he was getting revenge for being bullied all his life. He graduated from one of our district high schools one year ago. Why wasn't he identified as a student needing professional help to deal with his emotional health? Adding counselors to our campuses is literally a matter of life and death. We need funding to hire professionally trained personnel to identify and provide mental health services to those at-risk students in our school. 
I'm extremely disappointed that we must dance around the faction that always is against a minuscule tax increase, an investment that will secure the educational future of the students, depending on the Peoria Unified School District for an education. Peoria School Board members, I am asking you to approve the bond and override recommendation that is on the table before you for the November 2020 Arizona ballot. Thank you. <clears throat> Is that the last comment? Last comment? Yes, President Sandoval, that is the last comment for that agenda item. All right, thank you. Uh, once again, Ms. Pallas Thompson, if we can make sure that these individuals are um, thanked you know, for their time and their comments uh, regarding this matter and uh, along with any updates uh, tied to this uh, particular line item. I, I will, and I, I don't know if it's a point of order at all, but the student at Westgate did not graduate from our, our school he attended, but he did not graduate. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Um, okay. Uh, questions, comments, board members, Ms. Stone. Well, I don't have a lot to say on this issue. I do believe we need a new bond, but I think that, uh, I mean, I made my objections mm -hmm. clear when we started this. I think that we should ask next year. I don't think this is an ask we should put now. And if we have any hope of getting the override, I think we need to take this off the ballot. I, I think it needs to not go on and we need to go for it next year, not this not this year. And I, I, I'm not going to support putting it on the ballot this year. So I, I know we need it, but we can get it next year, pr probably easier, you know, and I'm just not going to support it this year. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Ms. Underhill. Um, so I guess I have a few things to say about the bond. Um, you know, we have had several failed attempts for a bond, which means that our issues with our facility needs have just continued to grow. Um, and we have many issues that we know about. This critical needs bond will allow us to address some of those critical issues of safety in some of our schools, as well as, you know, allow us to start moving forward with a future perspective with the purchase of the land for the high school. Um, I recognize that, you know, we are in the process of developing a facility utilization committee, and that committee will do the due diligence needed um, for us to figure out, you know, how best to um, utilize our schools throughout our district. But I also know that there's flexibility within this bond and this bond is at the right level that we will definitely be able to utilize these funds um, in a way that will maximize our existing schools and whatever we decide to do in the future. Um, I guess the, the biggest thing for me is that, you know, the committee did their extreme due diligence to figure out exactly what we needed. Um, if you look at the basically what turns out to be about 112,000, well, $110,000 bond without or 100, I'm sorry, 110 million dollar bond without the purchase of the land, um, you know, that barely touches some of our very critical needs within our district, um, you know, and on all of the schools that we have. So um, I guess I would just say that I think this is the time. Um, I hate for us to have to go out for yet another election. It is a costly venture. It tires out our community. And I believe our community will really rally behind the district because of the effort that has been put forth during this pandemic. Um, again, safety is going to be a key concern. Um, within this recovery period that we're going to go through. And finally, again, the data shows that that the combined secondary tax rate is going is projected to decrease um, with the bond and the override together. So I feel like our community is you know ready. I know it's not the most easy time for us to move this through, but I also believe that it's a continuation and a, an investment in our community that we need and our students need. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Underhill. Uh, Ms. Pingrelli? Oh, thank you very much. Um, you know, I believe on, on this particular item um, and that we do need to uh, set up the Facility Utilization Committee uh, first to find out where our needs are uh, before we put money in particular schools. If um, down the road, we're going to have to consolidate. Um, and I believe that uh, one initiative on the ballot stands a much better chance than two. Uh, so I have just one question for administration. 
if you could pick one of the two, which do you think is more critical? The override or the bond? And that could be for our, our superintendent, Ms. Myers, Mr. Reynolds. President Sandoval, President Sandoval, uh, Ms. Pingley, member. Before you speak, Ms. Myers, as superintendent, they're both important, they're both critical, but if I had to pick one, it would be the definitely the override. That is a media and not passing the override will cause us great, great angst um, in what we have to do. And Michelle, will, Ms. Myers, you can you can go on with that. But if you're asking me that that one is is critical, critical and critical. Linda, I, I, I thank you for your candor. Thank you, uh, President Sandoval, Mrs. Pingarelli, members of the governing board. As we've shared with the Citizens Advisory Committee and the governing board at past meetings, we are at the point in the time frame for our current 13% override that if it is not renewed this November, we will go into mandatory budget reductions beginning in fiscal year 2022 that um, will, will be close to $10 million from our budget. Uh, in 2020, our override has provided $27.8 million of additional funding for positions and programs to support our students. If the override is not renewed this November, the second year of the mandatory cutdowns increases to close to $19 million. And then the final year, it's completely phased out. The district would be put in a position to uh, reduce our budget significantly with, without a guarantee that a new override could be passed or put in place. And that, that could have longstanding consequences for the district for many years to come. So when looking at the two ballot questions, the fact that the sunset phase out is on the horizon for the 13% override if it is not renewed makes that initiative very important and critical to the ongoing success of the Peoria Unified School District. And Ms. Myers, thank you for your candor also. Um, now that's all the questions I have this evening. Thank you, Mr. Sandoval, President Sandoval. Thank you, Ms. Mingarelli. Uh, Ms. Sarah Martinez. Thank you, President Sandoval. Ms. Myers, uh, to reiterate with the bond, does the funds that the committee has looked into, uh, will they be addressing state, uh, state mandates to keep our schools in line with the law? Are there, is there funding allocated for those types of measures? President Sandoval, uh, Mrs. Seha Martinez, members of the governing board, with the facility assessment study that uh, was published this spring, uh, critical and essential projects were identified, including projects that had a safety component. So there are uh, critical needs embedded in the, uh, the dollars that are included in the $125 million potential bond authorization. Uh, included in that, we do have requirements for um, ADA compliance as well as city code compliance uh, requirements. But to answer your question, there are uh, critical and essential um, projects as, as well as safety projects as uh, identified by ADM group. I appreciate that insight and candor, Ms. Myers. And so for me, where I'm coming from, as I like to be compliant with the law and keeping our children safe, I am in support of the bond as I like to follow those uh, measures that were put for us. So with me, I am in full support of the bond. I would like to take a step, a step back as a governing board and remind our, each other and myself as well is that we are accountable for setting clear expectations and communication for our committees going forward. If we would like in the future a clear decrease, then be comfortable stating that. If we would like safety to be a priority, clearly state that because the onus is on us. And as we move forward, we continue to ask for uh, 
changes in block scheduling, which I would consider, or how we utilize our school sites, the governing board, it's on us to continue to push and meet so we can make these critical conditions decisions and we're not put in a position where we're unfortunately potentially delaying necessary um, moves. But with that said, uh, I am in support of the bond so that we can follow the law and stay compliant and keep our kids safe. Yeah, thank you for that, Ms. Sam Martinez. And uh, again, thank you fellow board members for um, all of your purviews and, uh, and, and candor. Uh, again, for me, uh, you know, I am, uh, when I take a look at these two measures, uh, you want being focused on people and programs, uh, the other being focused on uh, more structure, uh, buildings, et cetera, um, and uh, the safety and well-being, which is one of our perspectives and our strategic plan um, in addition to, um, you know, the uh, community connectedness and, and, and uh, you know, good stewardship of community resources, right? Um, which, you know, once again, I mean, the need of the district is greater than what this bond represents, but this bond will allow us to, again, at a minimum, you know, um, stay somewhat flat, right? So be good, um, you know, and our goal should always be to go from good to great, right? Uh, so, you know, I think with that said, I think we did, the, the committee really, um, you know, took a look at a really holistic view at, uh, one, the health and wellness and the needs of the district. Um, you know, again, ever since I've been on the board, we, we've needed, you know, schools up in the northern sector. So I think we're moving in that direction, which is great. Um, in addition to, you know, the uh, potential impact of, you know, uh, the, uh, the tax rates and, and how this does, um, you know, uh, you know, how we do include, you know, those uh, surrounding communities and those stakeholders in this, these discussions. Um, I think they've done that. And in addition to the flexibility of the bond, you know, as we go through, you know, our facility utilization uh, discussion, um, I, I don't disagree with you, Ms. Pingarelli, that is a discussion that is going to expose um, you know, some, some, you know, uh, incremental needs, uh, but, uh, you know, it's just, uh, uh, needs that go beyond really, um, you know, what, uh, what we're looking at, uh, right now, just to, again, just to, to, to be good, right. And to ensure the safety and well being of our students. Um, so that said, uh, you know, I am continuing, um, I'm, you know, I have continued support, of the uh, the $125 million bond to be placed on the, uh, the November ballot. And, uh, um, you know, and we just uh, you have to be diligent and, and smart about how we go to market. Like uh, I believe Ms. Sam Martinez was, was stating, it's, uh, we have a lot of data. Uh, we have a lot of knowledge uh, based on the last few times that we've gone out. Um, you know, we need to maximize uh, on opportunities uh, and, uh, and really leverage our wins and uh, and understand where we're going to realize the the, the biggest impact, you know, as we uh, go to market uh, with, with the campaign. So that said, um, uh, full support of the $125 million bond. Um, so with that said, uh, we will, I'll need a motion. If no other comments uh, or questions, uh, board members. Um, can can I, Mr. Sandoval, just just say a couple things? Sure, absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Um, I I just want to first of all thank the Citizens Advisory for all the work that they did. It was it was remarkable. They had meetings. I was able to plug in on most of them, and they were thoughtful. They were able to argue, um, but not be divisive. They were able to. Um, give their opinions and every opinion had a, a significant amount of facts attached to it. Secondly, um, I need to talk to, you know, thank Ms. Myers and, and certainly Mr. Duguid on the work that they have, have done with those committees. And, uh, I, I'm going to just have to say, Michelle, and I'm not calling you Ms. Myers. You have just done a remarkable job. Um, looking at all of the facts, all of the, the things and, and doing doing what was needed. But I also have to, to say to the board, um, I know how difficult this decision is. It, it should not be, regardless of whoever votes for what, 
and what they're doing that there is any sense that any of the board members who I have had the privilege of working with for the last five years or three years and and felt like five, felt like actually 1900 years if I, if I thought about it, um, but I've had the opportunity to work with people who do care about our schools, who do care about our children, who do care about our community, and uh, regardless of the vote that, that you make, that doesn't minimize any of that. So I, I need the board to understand and the community to understand that these votes are, are taken in the best interests of all of those people that we serve, our staff, our community, our children, and um, be comfortable that in your vote that that we will we will do what we need to do to um, make things happen. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Miss Miss Palisano, thank you for those words, and uh, I agree with you 100%. Um, it's the diverse lenses that make us smarter. And, uh, you know, and we have that on this board. So um, that's uh, something to certainly be proud of, you know, without question. Uh, that said, um, I, I do need a motion uh, for line item 8.2, consideration and possible adoption of a resolution ordering and authorizing all matters necessary for a bond election to be held on November 3rd, 2020. Um, I move that we, uh, sorry, do what you just said, David, consideration and possible adoption of a resolution ordering and authorizing all matters necessary for a bond election to be held on November 3rd, 2020. All right, I'll second that. So Ms. Contra, we have a motion by Ms. Underhill and a second by myself. If you can uh, please run us through a voice vote, I would appreciate it. Thank you, President Sandoval. Mrs. Pingarelli? Nay. Mr. Sandoval? Yes. Mrs. Stone? Nay. Mrs. Seha Martinez? Yes. Mrs. Underhill? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries 3 2. Thank you, Ms. Contra. Okay, moving along to 8.3, uh, Facility Utilization Committee Discussion. Uh, I don't believe we are being presented uh, uh, by uh, any, there is no presentation tied to this agenda item. I think it's just open for discussion amongst uh, not only our board members, uh, but also administration. Um, that said, you know, we, uh, we all know, we've all seen the utilization study that, um, you know, has been uh, presented to us uh, you know, with an understanding that, uh, you know, based on data, based on the, uh, the, uh, the diligent research that has been done by, you know, third party, uh, you know, resident experts, uh, that, uh, you know, we have some, uh, some work to do and other considerations, right? Uh, meaning involved in the, certainly the entire community, all of our stakeholders, uh, and, and, and truly uh, defining, you know, what that scope of work looks like uh, for this, uh, this committee. Um, you know, we need to be very, very clear on, you know, the areas that we, um, you know, definitely want them to, to look at, um, and not only from a brick and mortar perspective, but also how a site actually uh, impacts a community, right, and, and potential other, or the other usage, you know, for that site. You know, on top of that, we also need to consider the emotional impact uh, that uh, your families and uh, and students, you know, may go through, um, you know, as we go through this process. So, um, and lastly, uh, I just want to, you know, make a quick comment on the committee. I, I think, uh, you know, over the, we have a, a, a large community that is absolutely willing uh, to, uh, add their voice and lenses to to these committees, and uh, well, we've seen you know similar voices uh, from committee to committee as we, you know looks at if we look at the bond and, and override. Um, I think it it makes sense to still you know um, have some um, I guess knowledge and expertise you know from um, some of those committee members while bringing in 
new voices because um, you know some of those committee members you know have gone through the utilization study taken a deep dive into what it looks like um, have uh, just uh, you know some you know uh, knowledge base there that that I think will you know help you know uh, enhance the uh, productivity uh, of this committee but I do believe that uh, you know we should also take a look at you know what other volunteers that we have in our our list uh, uh, Miss uh, Miss Ari, I believe uh, you have, and, and probably others of the district, this list of uh, volunteers, and and really seek out, uh, send out a, a kind of a um, a uh, I don't know, a all hands on deck, or seek out, uh, or send out a, a notification or mer- uh, a message to the community asking for um, you know others to uh, submit their uh, uh, their I, I guess I'm going to call it an application, but that's probably not correct. Uh, to put their name in the hat uh, and then and then kind of move from there. So uh, that said, it's important. Uh, this is something that um, has been a long time coming. We need to go through it. Um, and uh, I'd like to open this up for further discussion and questions from our fellow board members. So, uh, Ms. Doan? I don't want to start this. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Ms. Ms. Underhill? Thank you, President Sandoval. No, I would agree with everything that you said. Um, This is going to be a really important process. Um, I think that it's critical that we ensure we do have representation from all four of the areas that we've kind of identified um, of our district, but we especially need to make sure that we have representation from those communities with schools that are older that are being, you know, that have lower numbers at this time that could potentially be impacted. Um, And I think that input beyond the committee Um, should go, you know, to reaching further into the community via community meetings, surveys, et cetera, because we want to make sure that we really understand, um, you know, what those schools mean, what the purposes are of those schools within those communities, and just make sure that we're really getting um, that information from as broad of a group of folks um, that are impacted as we can. Um, I also think, as you stated, for our committees, we, you know, we have also some dedicated volunteers that you know, spend years, <laughs> multiple months um, doing this this work, this diligence for various purposes. I do think that, you know, we are at a time where we need to look again at those lists and just make sure that we are allowing for additional and new voices to enter into these conversations. Um, and we also need to make sure that we make the opportunity to serve on these committees well known. And I know that's, you know, challenging at times, but I think we really need to make an effort for that. Um, especially at this time with something so um, potentially, you know, impactful as um, looking at facility utilization. So um, that's my biggest thing is just that we make sure that we have, you know, broad representation, especially from those um, schools that are currently being underutilized, those school areas um, that we advertise and let people know that this is an opportunity and that we have input beyond just that con- that committee um, through community community outreach and various things like that. So um, and I also hope that we can get going as soon as we possibly can. Thank you. Yeah, agreed. Thank you for that, Ms. Fenderhill. Uh, Ms. Ping, really? No, thank you very much. Um, uh, we had a, f- a facility use- utilization report that came out. When was that dated? Ms. Myers, was there a a comprehensive one that came out. President Sandoval, Mrs. Pingrelli, members of the governing board. The uh, report was published, you know, I, if memory serving me correctly, in, in late February, early March, and was presented to the Citizens Advisory Committee on April 15th. And so the district has the report for each school and um, that was published approximately March of 2020. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, just, uh, you know, I, I guess we're going to have to be mindful of, of uh, uh, this next school year and um, what our enrollment looks like, um, if it's up, if it's down, and, um, you know, where that uh, would be at. Um, I agree with uh, Mrs. Underhill um, to have is, uh, you know, many voices um to have input on this. Uh, I I would like as a governing board member to have at least, you know, have one pick 
Um, and uh, I would hope my other governing board members would would feel the same. But I think it should be as as broad uh, and as many as our superintendent feels um, is necessary. Um, you know, that's all I have at this point. I'd like to hear uh, what uh, the other governing board members has to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Pingarelli. Uh, Ms. Sam Martinez. Thank you, President Sandoval and fellow governing board members for, for being thoughtful in your approach um, and the courage to try something different. Ms. Pangarelli and I, and uh, we have attempted different models throughout um, our time as leadership on the board and we all recognize we're still missing a voice I would like to see as I enjoyed the process of selecting the superintendent with my fellow governing board members that we take a, co a cohesive approach and that we have interviews with all the committee uh, all the interested uh, candidates in the committee that who com submit the committee forms um, so that we can capture that voice and also a form of recruitment that you see um, not represented in the list. Uh, but for me, I like the board's input on who we have on the committee. Uh, so I will start there as having a form, uh, it doesn't have to be real extensive, but in, understanding their skill set, what they can bring to the PUSD, because this is also going to set our superintendent's vision uh, forward for the next few years, one, three, five years. Uh, so I would like to see a comprehensive committee group um, selected by the board and some input from administration, but it'd be a whole board approach. Uh, I would also highlight Ms. Underhill's um, statements in regards to process. I would like administration to identify a comprehensive process so that even though we have a set committee that it's almost like a traveling uh, school to school or area by area collective um, presentation. Uh, different forms of communicating using mail uh, mailers online, social media platforms, even where we take the initiative and make phone calls to gather some input. Um, and it's really going to be outside the box approach, something that is not what we've done before. Let's put your name on a list, have 13 members and then move forward. It needs to be innovative and let's practice what we preach in capturing those voices that we haven't heard from. So with that, uh, I don't know what the correct number is. We've heard 13, we've had 11, we've heard 18, we've had 33 on the budget committee. Um, I would really look for my board's uh, request and what's the magic number for the committee, but administration's input as you're gonna be working with them and guiding the committee through the process. So for there, I stand um, with my comments. Thank you, Ms. Sam Martinez. Um, President Sandoval. Yes, sir. Hi, this is Dr. Reynolds. Um, so I, I guess I, I want to um, be clear because uh, both Mrs. Palace Thompson, uh, who will be uh, starting this process, and, and myself who will be continuing it, I, I'm I'm trying to get a, a, a solid understanding. Uh, is the board suggesting that your that you would like? another committee of the board created. Uh, typically, this would be a committee of the superintendent uh, who would then uh, bring that recommendation to the board. So I, I need, I just need some clarification on what the board's expectation. Are you looking to um, what I assume would be to change policy and add another committee of the board? Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Reynolds, for me, um, and I, I absolutely see where, you know, Ms. Sam Martinez is, is coming from, um, and I think it's coming from a place of just, you know, ensuring that um, we have uh, broad representation, right, on, on this committee. Um, my hopes would be, you know, I know in the past, and Mrs. Pingarelli brought this up, is 
you know, if the board can have at least, a, you know, a minimum of, you know, one nomination, which could be based on our, um, I'm trying to use Ms. Sarah Martinez's words, are based on our parameters, I guess, and, and skill sets, right? Um, who we feel would, um, you know, uh, uh, certainly be an asset, you know, on this committee with the um, the districts, uh, you know, making recommendations uh, on their end to complete, whether it's, you know, 11, 13, or 15, you know, individuals. It seems as though the uh, Fine and Override Committee, you know, had a, had the, the right number. Um, you know, I think if you get uh, get too large, you start to, uh, it, uh, it, uh, I, I think it uh, makes for, you know, tough, a tough ability to 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 conclude uh, and then come up with uh, you know sound decisions, uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't. Uh, to Ms. Aaron Martinez's point, uh, you know, take the committee on the road uh, to all the communities, uh, all of our surrounding communities that the district serves, uh, to ensure that those voices, those communities, are included in the decisions that are made by the committee that we uh, that we mobilize, right? So, so Ms. Mar Sam Martinez, I guess my question, uh, my ask of you would be, do you feel that um, by allowing the board to have, uh, you know, a minimum of one nomination onto this committee um, would, uh, you know, kind of allow us to, um, have someone that aligns with, you know, I guess kind of the skill set, uh, the um, certainly, um, I guess, knowledge base uh, to uh, th that would address our, you know, kind of our, our recommendations there. Because one thing I wouldn't want to do is to have a static kind of um, matrix, right, that, you know, kind of defines who's right or not, because then we will have, I think that would influence more individuals of the same versus diverse individuals, right? So um, j just a question for you. No, I appreciate it. Uh, so I look at it a couple of a couple of ways. One, the great thing is Dr. Reynolds is new to our district in a sense, not new to education, but new to our district. So he's gonna be able to uh, look for those unique voices without the, um, the traditional ways of pure unified, if that makes sense. So I yep. recognize that. Uh, but on the other hand, w one of the priorities that the board has set forth as a goal um, is to continue to build trust and an understanding with our superintendent. And by representing um, the community from each of our different perspectives on his committee to lead, it's another avenue to um, gain trust. Now, is it a point where we have to change policy? Honestly, I don't know. I haven't researched what the policy states. I don't know if it's as easy as here's our recommendation, superintendent, and here you go, or because we have a policy, we have to make the change first before moving it that forward. That I would look for that guidance from the board, um, Ms. Contra and our superintendent in regards to those policies. But the more voices that we can capture, because we're still missing it, and even when I get on social media platforms, we're still seeing the same schools represented as is my number one concern. Uh, the other thing is the skill set. It, it, it what we have a large community we can tap into. Let's do that. Unused resources is something that we should be able to um, tap into. So the uh, I don't know what the right way is, but that's my intent. Um, President Sandoval. Yes, ma'am. So I guess my question is, um, Dr. Reynolds, uh, can you explain a little bit about the difference in process between if it was a committee of the board versus a committee of the superintendent? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question, Mrs. Underhill. Um, so a committee of the board would be very much like your budget committee uh, or your citizens advisory committee. Um, so, so those are those are the two committees of the board uh, that require public um, uh, all of the open. Uh, calls based on obviously the guidance from the governing board, 
Uh, and that's why I believe this topic is on here this evening. Um, okay. In that particular case, that would be a committee that uh, that I would call. Uh, and okay. and of course would would want to work with each of our board members to make sure that uh, you were comfortable with the uh, the voices that were being represented. And, and Dr. Reynolds, uh, President Sandoval, uh, members of the board, uh, a point of clarification: a, a budget committee can be a committee of the board, and, and many districts have that. With Peoria, we have had a budget team that um, that has acted as a team and not a formal committee of the board just for a point of clarification in comparison to our citizens advisory committee absolutely guess, thank you for that clarification mrs myers okay. i guess from my standpoint and i apologize just for not being more familiar with that but because of the nature and of this discussion and this study that this committee is going to have it feels to me like it should be something that would be open to the public as far as the discussions. I know that it makes it a much more difficult animal, but I just feel like it's, you know, it's pretty critical that we be as transparent as possible with this information. Um, and then secondly, as far as appointing individuals to the committee, to me, that's not important. Um, what's important to me is that we have a good representation of the individuals in the community that can speak for the community and, and represent those that will be, in, you know, impacted by whatever decisions are made. So I guess those are what my thoughts are right now. President Sandoval. Yes, if, sir. Uh, may, maybe it would be helpful, um, uh, it, it, Given given the 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 fact that that uh, Peoria has not uh, gone through a, a process similar to this um, in the past, maybe if I could just take a minute and and talk about how the process could potentially look, uh, and then w what I would recommend we do before making any um, decisions about creating a, a boards committee is is potentially bring a a of um, a, a draft of a of a process that we might use to go through this, so the board could see it. So, what what might happen in in, in a process similar to this is that uh, a, a a committee would come together. Uh, typically, a, a superintendent's committee uh, would come together, would review the data, would spend uh, a great deal of time really going through it. A community a uh, committee of stakeholders. Uh, and then be bringing um, some some initial recommendations that the board would be reviewing in study sessions, uh, potentially governing board meetings. Uh, those study sessions and meetings, you know, could potentially be held uh, in the communities that might be impacted. And so all of that would be out and transparent and in public uh, prior to the board. Uh, making a an, any final decisions on on what that would look like, but I guess my recommendation would be that you uh, you direct us, uh, direct me uh, and Mrs. Palace Thompson to put together that proposal, that potential timeline and plan, and uh, present that to the board uh, prior to uh, prior to making any decisions about um, adopting a or or starting a a new governing board committee. Yeah, now I, I do like that idea, but before I further comment, or um, we all further comment, Ms. Stone, I know you have your hand up, but I definitely want to hear from you. Thank you, uh, President Sandoval. I just, um, I think that it's important that this, I, I'm sorry, this needs to be a different group than the kind of groups we have um, with the advisory committee and things like that. These are, it's, it's a different animal, as you're saying. It's, it's a very different animal from um, like the bond and override and those things. I believe that um, I would like personally to know um, how the superintendent would make picks and, and what that would be like, because we need people that are knowledge. You know, I would like some people that are already knowledgeable about facilities and utilization issues. 
and and finance and things like that. Not just people that are emotionally involved and will be given a running um, education, if you will, from uh, our wonderful staff. I think we need some people that will understand right off the bat what's going on and and be open and and not be so as, as I think this decision needs to be made without as much emotion uh, because it, it is the it is the life of the district that's at stake here in some ways and it is it is bound to impact people very emotionally and emotions when when they guide your decisions you become a little illogical and I, I just want to say I'd, I'd like to see some people on there maybe that you know aren't even stakeholders I, I guess that's kind of a blasphemy in a way but I want to see some people on there that don't really have an axe to grind in the in the in the decisions but that just want to uh make a sound make sound financial decisions uh or you know that the, they could recommend to us because uh i i feel that emotion could get in the way of this issue and i would feel probably pretty comfortable with the uh recommendations made by our superintendent so Pre president sandoval um miss stone thank you yes, so sir. much for, for those i i have um uh, uh heard uh, loud and clear uh about uh, uh the the importance of ensuring that we have a variety of voices uh, on this committee, uh, a variety of levels of expertise and skill levels, uh, as well as uh, a variety of voices representing uh, different aspects and, and uh, parts of our district. Um, and so what, what I might recommend is that uh, as we look to our uh, as our as we look to our first retreat or study session in the new school year, which we, I think, if I remember correctly, we typically hold in July. Um, that at that study session or retreat, whichever we choose to uh, to call it, that uh, that we bring to you a, a timeline, a proposal, uh, some some criteria around the committee for your uh, for your discussion. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's a great idea. If I could ask, um, you know, within the proposal, that it also shows um, the process uh, to define the committee members and, and, and really from end to end, right? And even a, uh, a rough view of a timeline, right? So to to Ms. Senator Hill's point, I, I think this is definitely time sensitive uh, without question. On um, It would be great to, you know, also uh, um, always have a timeline kind of running. Uh, and uh, seeing where we're hitting our milestones, et cetera. So uh, yeah, that's it. That. That's if if there's, we can absolutely provide that. Perfect. Thank um, you, uh, Ms. Sam Martinez. Uh, you you have your hand up. I can't raise my hand. Thank you, President Sandoval. I'm I will have to agree with my fellow governing board members, Ms. Stone. You mentioned a different group. I agree. Um, with that perspective, Ms. Underhill, you, may, you mentioned the importance of the decisions that this committee is going to be discussing is crucial to building trust with their community and transparency. And that documented process uh, via the board committee is something that I've appreciated uh, that the Citizens Advisory Committee has offered. Um, we shouldn't shy away because our conversations are recorded uh, or because we have to provide this the data beforehand. It does take a lot more legwork. I recognize that. But these decisions are crucial. And for me, that documentation piece and the ability to have community access at any given time is important to continue to build trust for our community. And so when I'm thinking out loud is... It, what I understand, Dr. Reynolds, is there is a policy that specifically states that to document and have open meeting law, it's a committee of the board. And then if we have a committee of the administration, we essentially can get away with not offering that transparency. Is that what I am hearing? Well, 
N no, what, what I would say is that the transparency happens in, uh, in, a, in a different way where the board uh, receives updates at board meetings and study sessions uh, rather than uh, in the, the uh, uh, you know, weekly or monthly or whatever that timeline requires. Um, so the transparency always comes in the, the board reports, again, during board meetings and study sessions, rather than in the individual committee meetings, uh, much like uh, the, 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 the uh, many, many other committees that we have around the district. So in order, and forgive me for interrupting, President Sandoval, Dr. Reynolds, so in order for the community he to hear what is discussed at an administration committee, they had to do a records request? Uh, they, they could potentially. Um, I'm not sure what the, the public would request from a meeting, um, but yes, that, that could be possible. For that, I am I am going to clearly state my stance on that. I am not comfortable with that. We are literally talking about potentially shutting down schools and impacting large swaths of communities uh, in the southern side, as well as building new schools and boundaries in the northern side. Governing board, I urge you that we create a process that as a board committee person per creates per policy that these items are agendized documented and transparent for the community to see the whole process and for there i'll stand yeah thank you for that miss ann martinez and uh, dr reynolds um I, I i would agree um it, you know if we can i mean if it's a, a committee of the district uh, and there's a policy that we need to take a look at uh, that may need to be adapted to ensure that at least at a minimum, you know, our community could listen in to those meetings uh, and, and somehow provide public comment, uh, whether uh, it be during or at a, you know after the meeting, you know, via electronic submission or whatever that may be. But uh, I, I just feel that. Um, that may be a good solution without, you know, holding up the process. Um, I and I think from the board perspective, um, this is a, uh, a big decision, right? And um, no different to how we've been communicated uh, regarding COVID-19, uh, where we've had a COVID-19 update on every single board meeting. Um, you know, I, I think uh, that, uh, that similar protocol should be followed uh, with regard to um, this, uh, this utilization uh, committees, uh, whether it be, you know, at least at a minimum, uh, a fraud report every week, if not on the board meeting. But I just, what I don't, what I think sometimes gets us into um, situations is when there's too much time in between discussions or communication to the board and or community for that matter. Um, you know, there's, there's some things that have been lost um, and uh, potential opportunities, you know, for other lenses to provide uh, quality input uh, that would, uh, you know, uh, again, you know, make this process one that uh, is well thought out uh, and very inclusive uh, and uh, one that ensures that uh, PUSD continues along the path of being high, highly sought after by the community. Mr. Sandoval? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I think we understand and, and we can bring back a, a draft as, as Dr. Reynolds suggested, um, probably at a, at a retreat is, is a really good idea and but we have to make that retreat happen sooner than later, obviously. So we will, we will do that. What, what I'm curious about is, first of all, the ability of our board and, and our superintendent, our next superintendent to be able to define the problem. Why? Why are we? Why are we doing this? What is the need for this facility utilization group to meet? So a definition of problem is going to be critical, um, so that it's not a, a well. We kind of are doing it because that's what we're doing. So it's it's a de definition of problem. And then I'd like to also have you brainstorm. It doesn't have to be now on elements that we should be taking a look at. Our uh, open enrollment 
change. I know that that will be an issue. The uh, ability of, of projections of, of what's going to be happening um, in some of our north schools, but certainly in some of our south schools. Our, our communities have aged, but at some point they're going to be not aging schools. You know, that, you know, that those people will be moving out at some point and there will be other children coming in. Um, programs that you're trying to uh, look at as possible signatures or things that are not um, feasible as signatures. So when we come back together, you don't have to do it now, but I know that there'll be elements that you'll want us to take a look at. And certainly, you know, looking at all the four strategic areas is what we're trying to do fiscally responsible? Is it, are there issues that are safety and well-being issues that, that uh, this committee will be looking at? Which, which one is going to increase student achievement? And certainly the, the area of the, the community, community connected piece. So it's bringing that piece together. That, those, are the, those are the elements that if we can agree on beforehand, then people can make, as, as Mrs. Doan said, possibly unemotional decisions that are really best for not today, but five years from now too. So we're looking at, you're looking at things like that and it's developing a, basically a criteria checklist of have we covered all of those components? Yeah, no, I, I oh, sorry. go ahead, Corey. I'm sorry, I can't for some reason raise my hand on the device I'm using. <laughs> um, but no, I agree with that. I, I agree with Mrs. Doan's, you know, so, you know, comments about objectivity and, and individuals with certain skill sets, et cetera. I do agree with that. Um, but I also, I really am highly concerned just about the transparency aspect. And I do understand that, you know, giving you guys the opportunity to kind of come up with a process and laying that out. And obviously, like Mrs. Powell Thompson said, the key thing is identifying what is the goal of this committee. It may be that it starts out as more of a kind of a working in, internal type committee that has to hybrid into a, you know, more of a the open meeting law type committee as we move forward and figure out what decisions we have to make. I don't know, but I do appreciate you guys bringing forward kind of a plan for that. If there's a way to do it sooner rather than later, that would be great. I just hate for us to take a whole nother school year before, you know, things just kind of click along. So I just, I know there's a hundred other things in the way, but if any expediency on figuring out that process, I think would be great. Yeah, agreed, a hundred percent. Miss uh, Miss Powell Thompson, and I apologize. No, no, I I, I just um, I think Mrs. Sejas Martinez's um, idea of interviewing is really a good one. You know, instead of just selecting, we we do interview and and see the knowledge base and see the uh, you know what what the committee members bring with respect to diversity to this committee, diversity in thought. Yeah, agreed, 100%. Uh, this is a uh, um, a, a critical juncture um, within the district, and uh, um, and a some tough decisions, you know, that uh, that need to be made as well. So, um, you know, this uh, shall not be taken lightly. I agree with your statement uh, that we need to have a premise uh, and then a you know a treatment you know, to uh, to this discussion uh, without question. Now, whether that's uh, Ms. Contra, I don't know if you can help lead, um, you know, that discussion be email or if at the retreat, you know, we throw a bunch of, you know, thoughts on the wall, right? And, uh, and then what sticks, um, you know, helps us define our why with regard to the, uh, the uh, facility utilization committee. Ms. Uh, Sam Martinez, I think you have your hand up. I was just going to add, because um, I had one more comment, uh, one or two comments. One, these days I have lots of time. Uh, and two, scope. I know that I've heard that word from our Citizens Advisory Committee, defining the scope of, of, their, um, of the committee's goals. So that was it. Thank you. Yep. Uh, agreed. 100%. Yep. Ms. Contra, I, you, it looks like you were going to say something. Yes, sir. I was just going to answer that I'd be happy to help um, facilitate that discussion and organize those uh, requirements in whatever way uh, is best to do so. Okay. And I think potentially, I mean, in light of, 
you know, COVID and, and uh, potentially our um, inability to um, meet the face to face soon. Um, I think a similar uh, result can be had um, if board mem members submitted their whys, you know, to, to you. Um, and if they get dropped into a spreadsheet and you kind of filter the commonalities, right? Um, you know, which may, may uh, help us through this process electronically. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I'd be happy to receive those. Okay. Board members, any thoughts on that? I don't want to um, um, claim that that's the best um, process, but uh, what are your thoughts there? Um, President Sandoval, this is Corey. Um, I, I agree with that. I think that it would be great to have, you know, administration kind of lay out what their draft is of how they see this process rolling out. And then, you know, we can obviously have our thoughts prepared as well. But, you know, we can kind of start there. I think that would be great. Yeah, perfect. Agreed. Agreed 100 percent. All right. Ms. Pallas Thompson. No, I'm 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 I'm. I'm good with with uh, the direction. I can I serve on the committee? Can I be interviewed? Uh, yes, you can. Okay. <laughs> let, let, let me be interviewed. So, um, President President Sample, just just to clarify, so we are going to uh, schedule a uh, study session on facility utilization uh, and our plan to uh, address facility utilization across the district in July, where uh, where the administrative team will put together uh, a plan, timeline, scope, uh, process, uh, a process to to identify a variety of voices for for this group, and then uh, at that time, then and the board will weigh in. So I just want to make sure that that's that's the direction. Uh, yeah, that's that's what, what I'm hearing. That seems to be the consensus. Thank you very much. We'll be ready to go. Thank you for that. Uh, board members, any other comments, questions uh, around the 8.3 Facility Utilization Committee discussion? All right, no, no hands uh, being raised. So we'll uh, thank you for, for the commentary. Uh, moving on to uh, 8.4, uh, the COVID-19 updates, uh, Dr. Reynolds. President Sandoval and Dr. Reynolds, I apologize. I have one public comment for this agenda line item. Perfect. Uh, yep. So this public yes. comment, this public comment is from Mrs. Jill Melarani. Good evening, President Sandoval, members of the governing board, and Mrs. Pellis Thompson. My name is Jill Melarani. I am a frontier elementary parent. As Arizona opens and school districts look at the 2020-2021 school year, I would like to share a few thoughts as a concerned parent. I ask that you consider a phased approach with limited students on campus wearing masks in socially dis distanced classrooms. As a practical example, take a fourth grade class with four sections, 30 students per class. These students would be evenly distributed among four teams, A, B, C, and D teams, only one team, the A team, would be on campus for a two week period. This allows for the proper amount of social distancing as you would only have one, only approximately seven students per classroom. The remaining three teams would participate from home via live streaming. Every two weeks, the next team, team would rotate in with the remaining teams learning from home. This proposal helps to mitigate many risks, such as students that are sent to school ill, as well as children that may refuse to wear masks or taunt other students by spitting on them or spreading the virus in other ways. It is my opinion that there will be no normal until a vaccine is created and distributed, and that this is more about adjusting to the current environment rather than trying to fit a re reality that no longer exists. Thank you for your time. I hope all of you and your families are happy, healthy, and safe. Thank you for that, Ms. Contra and uh, Ms. Bell Thompson. Once again, if we can make sure that uh, Ms. Melinari is, uh, you know, thanked for her uh, her voice and uh, you know communicated with any updates around uh, COVID nineteen. Hopefully, some of those questions will be answered uh, as Dr. Reynolds uh, goes through his presentation. Will do. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Reynolds. 
Thank you, President Sandoval, Governing Board, Mrs. Palace Thompson, Cabinet, and those listening uh, around our community. It has been an incredibly busy couple of weeks uh, with some new information coming our way that continues to to shape our thinking and our planning around uh, our COVID response. I'm sure uh, many of you heard our governor this afternoon announce that schools are able to open. Uh, of course, we've been planning for that probability for well over a month and our, our task force continues to, to plan accordingly. Uh, first, I'd, I'd like to highlight, many of you have talked about this uh, earlier, uh, but I, I would like to highlight both our elementary and our high schools for their extraordinary attention to uh, to our students. Uh, I was able, as well as some of uh, many of you, able to participate in several eighth grade promotions and high school drive through graduation ceremonies. And we all saw firsthand how our principals and their teams worked hard to make their students feel known, feel cared for, and feel valued. It was a wonderful week of celebrations for our school communities, and we are all incredibly proud of the work that uh, our schools and, and their leadership uh, did. Uh, next is just a quick update on our high school graduation uh, scheduled for June 26th and 27th. Um, right now, uh, we don't anticipate, and working with State Farm Stadium, we don't anticipate being able to com be completely open for large events. So State Farm Stadium is now limiting seating uh, at graduation to two tickets per graduate. Uh, so that's a bit of a change. We continue to work closely with state leadership and health officials, as well as State Farm Stadium, uh, to to see whether we'll, we'll be able to hold an event as large as this, even with just the two tickets, uh, but we remain hopeful. Uh, we are also looking at potentially surveying our community, uh, our seniors and, and their families to see after our uh, drive-through graduation, how many families uh, plan on or are willing to participate in a graduation ceremony now that they've they've had that drive-through experience uh, and know about the limited seating. So we'll be uh, exploring that option. We have a plan to begin opening a few of our services around the district. Our plan is to uh, begin to open up uh, some of our athletic and, and music uh, activities. Uh, on ju June 8th uh, under strict social distancing and disinfection guidelines. It's important that our community understand that as we do this, uh, if we find that we are unable to follow these guidelines, if we can't do it safely, then we will immediately re-examine this decision. Uh, we're also working with the city of Peoria and our own Kids Zone program to begin offering services uh, on approximately June 15th, again, abiding by strict social distancing guidelines. Uh, and if these pr programs, uh, including some of our athletic and, and potentially music activities, uh, if they are successful, we will then look to begin to open some of our other facilities uh, to our community in July. We have some exciting news. Uh, we have collected uh, approximately 5,000 of our over 6,000 computers that we loaned out to students and uh, continue to implement our plan to reach out to our families uh, to ensure that we bring back the rest. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, our task force remains hard at work to create a plan to open for the fall as uh, the member of our community addressed earlier. Our goal is to uh, announce that that plan, uh, discuss it with the board, obviously, and announce that plan uh, in July. We still have um, a major obstacle to overcome, and that is, and that is how Arizona funds its schools. Uh, we continue to advocate to our state officials that there be some flexibility in uh, our current year funding formula. This formula really restricts us. Uh, from being able to be creative in providing safe learning environments uh, and examples like uh, the, our, um, our, our uh, member of our community mentioned earlier about a potential A, B, I think in hers was C, D uh, schedule. We need our state decision makers to allow schools to provide safe environments without sacrificing the limited funding that we currently receive. And it's an imperative uh, to being able to meet uh, the needs of our community. So uh, just as a reminder, we are planning uh, 
to provide one or all of the three options that we've been discussing. That would be uh, all students uh, coming back to our campuses, uh, adhering to the CDC guidelines and social distancing guidelines, uh, an online option for students, as well as a potential blending of those two options. Uh, I also want to make sure that our community understands that, that we have teams across the district working on solutions from everything from how we're going to bus students to how we're going to onboard uh, new employees from uh, our e-campus school and how we're going to expand that to the daily cleaning of our facilities. Uh, we have teams focused on student health, elementary education, high school education. Uh, we have teams, uh, a team working on how we're going to feed students throughout the day and what that's going to look like. Of course, our PR team is working uh, every day on how we're going to communicate all of this to our community. Uh, uh, and oh yeah, uh, in their free time, uh, members of this team, our nurses, have made over 4,000 masks for our employees as well. Uh, I also want to remind our parents, students, and staff that we have sent out surveys uh, to your email accounts uh, so that our stakeholders can provide us feedback on not only how we did to respond to the pandemic this spring, uh, but also for our community to help us plan for the opening of schools. And so please take a few minutes, uh, look for that survey in your email, and and take the time to help us plan for uh, the future of the, the children and our employees in, in Peoria Unified. Uh, again, as I've stated in the past, uh, our superintendent, Mrs. Pallas Thompson, uh, is leading our district through this crisis, and her wisdom and guidance and love for our families and employees is the reason why we continue to be a beacon that uh, others look to as we navigate this pandemic. I am very proud of the work that we have done, uh, but we all recognize that we have a great deal of work left to do, uh, and we are we are hard at work doing it. Uh, so with that, our team is here uh, and available this evening uh, to address any questions you may have. Yeah, Dr. Reynolds, thank you for that, uh, for that update. And uh, yes, agreed. Uh, your Superintendent Pallas Thompson, uh, your leadership and that of your, your leaders there at the district level and, uh, you know, certainly site leadership and all of our teachers and staff which just continue to do phenomenal work. Uh, and, you know, certainly, uh, you know, given the, uh, the environment that we were handed over the last, uh, what, uh, three, four months. So, um, thank you very much for, you know, to your just continue to lead with others in mind. Um, that said, um, Ms. Stone, uh, any questions, comments for Dr. Reynolds and team? I would like to say thank you for the update. And um, yes, some impressive work being done, getting things done during this time. And uh, I appreciate it and all your hard work. I appreciate everybody that's been doing whatever um th there's been a lot been going on not not just a few people it's been it's been a very large team effort and i'm very appreciative to all who have contributed thank you thank you miss stone uh miss andrea um yes i would echo that you guys are just doing amazing work just under incredible circumstances and I know it's probably just week after week and thing after thing, and yet you have to be so future focused as well. So just appreciate your diligence, all of you. Um, one question, I, and I know this is like far out there, but um, is as we're talking about options A, B, and C, you know, and I know we don't know what that's, or option one, two, three, we don't know exactly what those things are going to look like, but I'm assuming that within those conversations, we're also looking at you know, how are we looking at grading and those kinds of things for students as well? Is that part of that discussion? Thank you, Mrs. Underhill. Yes, absolutely. Um, what, you know, Mrs. Pallas Thompson has really challenged us to, uh, to look at what we do, how we do it, uh, and how we can do it differently, uh, how we can get better, how we can use uh, these circumstances, the difficult circumstances, to uh, to improve our, our organization um, for uh, and and learning for our students. So, all of those things are are taking place. Great, I figured. I just I know that's a big 
<laughs> it was one thing when we had to do it right for six weeks, but it's it's real different now that that is going to be our new normal. So that just was something I was wondering about. But again, thank you for all your efforts. You're exactly right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Underhill. Uh, Ms. Pingrelli. Oh, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Reynolds, when will we get the, the survey data uh, back to the governing board? Mrs. Pingarelli, um, are you referring to the potential survey data from uh, graduation or the, the survey data that we currently have out? The survey data you currently have out. So the closing date, and I am going to look to uh, Mrs. Airy, I believe the survey closes on June 2nd. And so we would be prepared to present that data along with uh, in our next COVID update. Uh, and, and if we have that sooner, obviously, we can provide it in a Friday report to the governing board. Okay. Um, and then uh, I just wanted to get some clarity on um, the grading system this time. The students did not come back after kind of the spring break. Uh, so for nine weeks, the students were able to accept the grade that they had before they went out. Is that correct? And are we, I think Mrs. Underhill um, alluded to that. Uh, are we going to look at um, look at that for the future if the students can't come back full force um, in the fall? So, first of all, uh, yes, ma'am. We we that was our uh, process and our procedure that we had in place when we came back from spring break. It was important uh, to all of us, given the uncertainty of what we were dealing with, to to provide our students an opportunity to either um, uh, accept the grade that they had uh, when they left or work to improve that grade. Uh, and I believe that. Uh, although there were some challenges with that, it, it ended up being uh, successful. Um, the the bigger piece uh, with that was uh, really finding ways to encourage uh, our students to continue to participate in that learning, giving that that, that that was our procedure and, and teachers expressed as we made phone calls uh, to them and, and asked for their input um, that that was a challenge for them and so we're going to continue to uh, to focus on that as we move to the fall uh, and it, this becomes as Miss under Mrs. Underhill uh, suggested our, our new normal uh, we have instructed the task force to uh, to work with teachers to find ways to uh, to to have a grading system in place, uh, regardless of whether it's online, face to face, or uh, a blending of the two, uh, that that will accurately assess uh, a child's learning throughout the the semester. Yeah, I I hope that uh, that is the case because I've I did have a lot of complaints. Um, um, this past semester, uh, or this past, you know, two months, um, in that um, students, if they did not have to, uh, I, I guess if, if, if they accepted the grade that they had um, before the, the break, did they still have to do any work week, week by week? Were, were there lessons, or did they have the ability to stop nine weeks ago? So the answer is yes to all of those. Um, you know, we, we did, we do have students who, who were unable to, or did not have access to um, Wi-Fi and technology and would have been unable to uh, participate in that way with their classes. And so that's why we wanted to make sure that we held those students harmless. Uh, we had uh, anecdotally talking with many teachers from around the district, um, even even though, and I'll use my own my own children as an example, even though they uh, were able to take their grade in the third quarter, they continued to participate. 
uh, and and uh, and be part of their class and be part of learning. So, again, the answer to your your questions are all yes, um, and that's why we wanted to create that flexibility for our families so that if if they were in a position where either they couldn't participate. Uh, didn't have the resources to participate, uh, or just had challenges at home that they weren't being, um, for lack of a better word, punished uh, for their circumstance. All right. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. Thank you, Ms. Pingarelli. Uh, Ms. Dan Martinez? Thank you, President Sandoval. Um, as we continue to look at policy and this new environment, I would also encourage uh, the administration to review our grading policy system. I've always stood by uh, um, standard-based grading, but in lieu of the uncertainty of a pandemic, this is a good opportunity to look at our grading policy and um, have the administration bring forward any recommendations that we should consider as um, as the year goes on. Um, well, so just to add to that last comment, but in regards to the topic as a whole, again, thank you administration. We are in constant contact either by our superintendent, Ms. Pellis Thompson, or even Dr. Reynolds checking in on me personally, as well as giving updates of the state of the district. So I appreciate you finding time to continue um, to bring us updates. I know we've had extensive conversations. One idea that was brought forth was a flexible schedule. Um, being mindful of our staff that they may or may not have children but other needs and could a day uh, look non-traditional if we start at 8, 8 a.m. and then they have a split schedule and then they're doing or covering classes in the evening but what was brought to my attention was the impact of funding at the state level of offering an A-B schedule and so the end of the day, my ask to the administration, what can the board do to help our district through these trying times of COVID-19? What do you need from us? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Mrs. Seal Martinez, I, I think, you know, given the, uh, the importance of your voice uh, in the community, uh, and the community in the community of Peoria and Glendale, as well as the the community at large of Arizona, uh, any help you can be in advocating for flexibility in how the state uh, considers or what the state considers as seat time, um, we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, right now, that is our um, that that feels like a, a bit of an uphill battle for us, uh, but we really do need that flexibility in order to be able to adjust uh, our our school sites uh, to be able to to do something similar to, to what our uh, community member mentioned earlier. Thank you for that, Dr. Reynolds. Um, that is good to know, as many of us have different opportunities to speak to different uh, decision makers. Um, I also want to highlight the efforts of our district in seeking feedback on different social media platforms. I've seen elementary schools and high schools advertising or marketing that we are trying to capture their voice, good, bad, or indifferent. And just on the comments alone, I see some opportunities, but what I have recognized as a trend is that our parents want their students to come back to school because it's not just a opportunity and opportunity for academics. It's the opportunity to build communication skills, problem solving, social interaction, that our Peoria Unified School District offers much more than the rigor of reading math and um, writing. So that is good to know. We have opportunities to capture um, our underrepresented school sites. So I look for those innovative ideas. What has also been brought to my attention, Dr. Reynolds, is as we make contact for collecting laptops, is some of the phone numbers are disconnected. What is um, 
what have you heard about the inability to make contact as a result of email uh, not working, a phone number being disconnected, and what's our solution to address that? Sure, yes, th thank you again. Uh, the inability uh, or the, I would rather say, the, the inaccuracy of the, the contact information that, that we may have for a family is, is a, uh, a challenge that we faced long before, uh, long before COVID. Uh, that is a challenge that we just face as, a, as an organization, as a, a community service organization. And, and so, um, you know, our families, a lot of our families are, are very mobile uh, and they have circumstances that, uh, uh, you know, require them to either change addresses or phone numbers change. And, or in, in some circumstances, families just forget to update their information. And so you're, I, th I thank you for highlighting that because that is a significant challenge and a, and a challenge that we've been, that we've been uh, talking about. Uh, our plan when it comes to specifically um, uh, getting back uh, the computers that we, that we loaned out to our families, um, you know, we, we fully expect uh, those families to be rejoining us in the fall. And if we are unable to make contact at this time, um, we are, we're very hopeful that uh, as the children come back to our school, uh, that we'll be able to connect with those families then uh, and to get that. Remember when we, when we presented this plan to begin with, um, in our plan, we were willing to accept um, that, that, that we will have some loss, uh, that we will have some damage, uh, and that that loss and damage was a, a risk worth taking to ensure that uh, the the six thousand uh, computers that went out, the six thousand students, the families that were positively impacted by this program, um, it was it was well worth it. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds, and definitely I would agree. And even if they kept those laptops during the summer and used them and we didn't get them back to until the new year, I wholeheartedly believe um, that's for a great cause. Uh, so, but just keeping in mind, I know our teachers have been active. I see on the posts making contact with their students and, and being able to check in on their well-being if need be in the future. Something I would like to see that we maintain uh, updated contact information and for our site administrators who have the most uh, first-hand experience with our parents and students that they look to solutions to update um, that contact information. I uh, would also lean into uh, uh, some comments that were said in the previous board meeting in, in regards to travel requests. F first, I'm going to lead with safety. Even though the governor has uh, highlighted that we move forward uh, with starting the school year in the fall, uh, there's still not a vaccine and there are a lot of recommendations by the CDC. I would like my fellow governing board members as I will consider, consider voting down all travel requests now until we get a more sol solidified uh, response on how to move forward to keeping our students and staff safe as well as fiscal planning we have a very skinny budget and every penny is going to be imperative to provide the support we need to um, make sure our children are served as a whole as well as our staff are maintained their safety so as the administration considers approving any travel requests, please know that for the remainder of my term, I will not be supporting any travel requests for those two reasons, safety and fiscal planning. Um, I know there hasn't been any recommendation yet, but uh, please uh, be mindful in that approach. Um, and my Mrs. last... Mrs. Yes. Mr. Sayal Martin, if, if I might just jump in quickly. Uh, I apologize for not putting that as part of the update. Uh, I. Um, we have ceased uh, all travel through June uh, and are committed to reviewing that in July uh, and hearing your feedback. Um, you know, that is that is something that we'll be uh, reviewing and, and obviously taking taking your feedback and others um, as we move forward. So thank you for that. Thank you. I appreciate that.
And the last thing on the positive note is I have heard parents uh, ask me, as well as myself, I have two boys that are wanting to help out or um, as mom wants them to help out, a volunteer link on our Peoria Unified website where students have the ability if they want to serve their community. I know I have we have great relations with uh, American Legion Post 62 in the Peoria, city of Peoria. Um, if in the future there were opportunities, we can create a link. I know Habitat of Humanity I've looked into has opportunities for students as young as 11. Um, but, but I would like to see that the Peoria Unified create a list for volunteer opportunities for our students if they would like to participate. That's a, a great idea, uh, Mrs. Seha Martinez. Uh, we have so many wonderful service organizations, student service organizations uh, in our in our district uh, that are are run by students, and and their whole purpose is to to provide service to their community. And I bet you we have uh, a lot of resources to be able to help us create that list. So thank you for that idea. Excellent. Thank you so much. Other than that. Um, I appreciate everybody's sacrifice and and uh, opportunity to serve and please continue to let us as board members know how we can help. Thank you, Ms. A. R. Martinez for those uh, those comments. Um, Superintendent Palace Thompson, Dr. Reynolds uh, leadership again, I think, uh, you know, as we look into, you know, the opening of schools time frame. Um, um, I just like to, you know, uh, recommend really, and I'm sure you've already had these discussions and are doing so, but recommend that uh, the same level of urgency, uh, compassion, intentionality that we led with, you know, as we, you know, exited uh, the, the most recent academic year, uh, maintain that same, uh, those same levels. Um, you know, going into uh, the, the the fall and the uh, the subsequent academic year, um, you know, as mandates come down from the state, CDC, um, who, et cetera, um, this kind of will fall in line with uh, something similar that Ms. Seah Martinez uh, mentioned. Um, just yes, we have to follow those guidelines without question, um, and they're there for the. Uh, the health and wellness and safety, you know, of our, our, uh, you know, all 40,000 plus, you know, associates, uh, well, well, human beings, I should say, uh, that we, we serve, but, um, also allow morality and ethics to kind of weigh in, 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 the, in our decisions. Um, you know, as we, uh, look to these plans, these different plans, uh, entering into the subsequent uh, academic year, right? So, you know, what additional, layers of safety, um, you know, that uh, we can add into the already, you know, I'm going to call it already complete plan coming down from the state and the CDC. So um, just uh, always keep in mind, you know, where, you know, we are here to enrich lives of others and we're dealing with human beings and, uh, you know, uh, allow morals to, uh, to be weighted uh, in those, uh, those decisions. So all that said, it is great to see that our summer meal service is uh, in, uh, I'm going to say, full force, uh, if, if that's uh, okay to say, uh, as of May 26th. Uh, I know that was one of the things that we've talked about in the past, ensuring that, uh, you know, our families, our students, uh, and uh, certainly our most vulnerable uh, kids uh, continue to, um, um, you know, realize, um, you know, a meal uh, on a daily basis. So thank you for that. And just... Thank you again, you know, for uh, uh, leading with others in mind and um, and, and and truly uh, uh, understanding, you know, what it means to be courageous leaders. So, uh, you know, thank you for that. M Mr. Board Sandoval, members, can, can I yes, just mention, Mr. Sandoval, I'd like to just mention and and um, that, that our national board certified teacher, Miss uh, Mrs. Jana Gino, has been very involved at the state level and is. Uh, been with with uh, brings us back a whole lot of information. So and and is a, a strong advocate for Peoria and what we're doing. So um, as as you're mixing and trying to to 
build uh, some political involvement with decisions that will be made in the next month. She's a really uh, a good person to contact because she's right there at the committee level um, with the State Department. Gotcha. No, that's great to know. Thank you for that. And we'll, uh, you know, we'll absolutely uh, uh, take advantage of that, uh, that connection. Um, President Sandoval? Yes, ma'am. Um, this is Corey. Um, this, I just was curious, um, as Dr. Reynolds mentioned, advocating around seat time and the utilization of state funding, um, the ratification of the Arizona online instruction statement of insurances piece that was in the consent agenda, if we, if that is received and approved, does that give it, get us any additional seat time in a virtual environment or what's the relation there if we can talk about that at this point? That's a, a great question, Mrs. Underhill. Um, when we look at, a, at AOI, uh, the, the acronym for uh, what you just described, uh, our application uh, is to expand our current AOI program from 9-12 to K-12. Um, and that's something that I, I'm really excited about, regardless of um, the impact that it, that it may have as we, we work to address the needs of our students um, in, in the fall uh, in regards to COVID. Um, in the AOI piece, um, we are funded at a, at a lower level uh, when we register students uh, in, that online, uh, in that online format. And, and the, I, I believe the rationale, uh, obviously wasn't part of, of uh, putting that together, but I believe the rationale is that if, if you have students uh, online, uh, that you, you don't need services um, like a, a, a lunch aid or an instructional aid, or you don't need a crossing guard, those kinds of things as, as a student. Um, the problem with that is as we look to be creative uh, in, a blended, in a blended model, uh, we, we still have those people, uh, and still have those needs, uh, but yet would, would potentially be funded at a lower level for the students that we, that we might put in a, a class like that. So it really is, um, you know, the online piece we we really feel good about, um, of course, coming back in a, in a, uh, a somewhat normal manner, um, although potentially unlikely, um, we're, we obviously feel good about that. Uh, the real challenge that we're having is in that blended piece where uh, students would be on campus sometimes and then potentially online others. And so that's, that's where that challenge is. We absolutely, it's critical that we have uh, the agreement that you approved uh, earlier in place. Uh, and so we'll be excited uh, to see if we get that approved through the state of Arizona. That's great. No, I appreciate that. And I also, you know, truly recognize, and I think many parents do the, you know, the extreme value of being able to at least do a hybrid model because of the, you know, the social emotional aspects and, and obviously the, the schools provide a lot of services. So I don't know if there's at some point where we, you know, approach address, you know, looking at the AOI statement and, and, you know, how that might need to be changed as well, but just wanted to make that connection. So thank you. Thank you. And and, and uh, Mrs. Myers and, and uh, our entire team, we're, we're now in the process of, of working um, to uh, look at our plans and start to look at seat time and current year funding and then be able to, to share with you what our uh, projections are uh, or potential impacts may be uh, when it comes to, to funding. So uh, look for that as we, as we work through the month of June. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Underhill, for that question. Uh, board members, any other questions, comments? Perfect. Dr. Reynolds, thank you very much for, for the update. Thank you, sir. Okay, moving right along uh, to Section 9, Informational Reports, uh, Budget Facilities Planning and Construction Report uh, can be seen on our website. 9.2. Report on upcoming meetings and events. Uh, Miss Perry, any anything to to call out? 
President Sandoval, thank you. You heard Dr. Reynolds mention our graduations, and I did just want to add to the report that he gave that we did send out some communication to our parents this evening, and so we will continue to keep them updated as those dates approach, and of course, those are all uh, pending the current environment, and uh, if it is feasible for us to proceed with those uh, as planned, we will certainly do so, but we will continue to keep our parents updated. Perfect. Thank you for that. Okay, moving on. 9.3 local, state, and federal legislative updates. Uh, Ms. Myers. Good evening again, President Sandoval, members of the Governing Board, and Mrs. Palace Thompson. The Arizona Department of Education is going to release information tomorrow about the application process for CARES funding for Arizona school districts. The Arizona Education Stabilization Fund includes $277 million for K-12 education. Eligible districts will apply for grant funds through ADE, which can be used for COVID-19 relief, preparedness, and related expenses. In addition, the governor's office is providing nearly $600 million in COVID uh, or coronavirus relief and recovery dollars for local Arizona governments and nonprofits as part of a funding plan announced by the governor uh, this week. The plan includes $441 million in direct flexible funding to local cities, towns, and counties that did not receive direct funding earlier this year from the federal government. In addition, local governments, including schools and related entities, will be eligible for uh, expedited reimbursements from the Federal Emergency Management Administration Department for coronavirus-related expenses. And you may recall in our consent agenda, we did bring forward uh, a signature authority document for grant applications through the Arizona Department of Emergency and Military Affairs, which is the state agency administering that grant from FEMA, and Peoria Unified does plan to apply for those grant dollars. And finally, the Senate adjourned then ADA on May 26th this week. This follows the House adjourning last Thursday uh, of last week, which now has effectively finished the 54th legislature's second regular session. We do expect a special session to be called in the future to address the finite financial impact of the COVID-19 virus, and we will update you accordingly. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Myers. Uh, 9.4 district enrollment reports for the month of April 2020. Uh, those can uh, be found on our website as well. Uh, moving on to section 10, 10.1, board member opportunity to readdress agenda items. Uh, Ms. Doan, any items that you'd like to readdress? No, thank you, Mr. Sandoval. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Underhill. No, thank you. Ms. Fingerelli. Uh, no, thank you. Ms. A.R. Martinez. No, thank you. All right. 10.2, uh, draft agenda for the June 11th, uh, 2020 regular board meeting. I know we'll be meeting with uh, district leadership, uh, I believe, on Monday, considering you guys are on 410s. So we're looking forward to that meeting to complete this. Thank you for that. 10.3, report. Request for agenda items for future governing board meetings. Uh, Ms. Dunn? I don't have anything at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Underhill? I don't have anything at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Fingerelli? I'm good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. A. Martinez? Uh, President Sandoval, I do have one uh, is to discuss liquidated damages temporarily um, for those impacted since the governor shut down uh, schools in relation to the policy circumstances beyond the employee's uh, control. Uh, and yes, does that make sense? <laughs> um, yes. Uh Kim, did, uh, do you have any questions on that request? And I'll second that, by the way. Thank you, President Sandoval. No, no questions. I understood. Okay, perfect. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Martins. Thank you. Um, okay, moving on to Section 11, 11.1, adjournment. Uh, I do need a motion to adjourn. 
I move that we adjourn at 8.36. Second. We have a motion by Ms. Sam Martinez and a second by Ms. Underhill. Ms. Contra, if you can uh, walk us through a voice vote, that would be great. Yes, sir. Mrs. Pingarelli? Aye. Mr. Sandoval? Yes. Mrs. Joan? Aye. Mrs. Seha Martinez? Aye. Mrs. Underhill? Aye. All right, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody, uh, board members and district uh, leadership. Uh, have a great evening. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.